Excellent, excellent. Good evening, everyone. Good to see so many people uh, in furious agreement that there's nothing decent on television tonight. Uh, lovely of you to come out. Welcome to the Wheeler Centre. My name's Michael Williams. I'm director here. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this event as part of our America series. Uh, when, uh, when our associate director, Jenny Niven, and I were talking about doing a series on America this year, one of the things we talked about was the kind of abiding hypocrisy that exists in the Australian attitude to America and Americanness, where on the one hand we have this kind of superiority thing going on, and on the other hand we slavishly adore the cultural output of that country. And so tonight is our chance to have a look at an art form that uh, we feel, and we suspect you feel, uh, America is somewhat in the ascendancy with regards to. That was tortured syntax, but I think you understand what I mean. Uh, I'm going to introduce my very distinguished panel tonight who are going to help me discuss the ins and outs of American TV. Uh, at the far end of the stage is Debbie Enka. You'll know Debbie's work from The Green Guide. You may know her from 774, uh, where she appears regularly on John Fain's show. She's been writing in The Green Guide for... Ever. <laughs> Forever, and continues to work. For a really work. long time. Fairfax journalist, still working. I think that's worthy of a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Please so, keep buying the paper. <laughs> keep buying it, or it, it, they've got it online. You don't have to pay. It's amazing. Um, oh, sorry, that's upsetting. That is upsetting. Uh, next to Debbie is Jess McGuire. Jess McGuire is one of Triple R's Breakfasters. She's a writer and broadcaster of distinction. Um, she first appeared on the Breakfasters as the, I think, probably first appeared as the weekly TV critic. Um, which consisted basically of uh, Jess catching us up on whatever DVD she'd been lent for the week, pretty much, and her slightly disturbing passion for reality television uh, occasionally. But you kept that under, under wraps mm. where you could. Uh, but Jess uh, is, uh, she wrote for Defamer Australia for many years, was the editor of it, and is a cultural critic of note. Please make her very welcome. How do you like of note? Was that pompous enough? It was, it was really good. I'm going to change my bio and update it to everything that you said tonight. Either of note or of distinction. I, I couldn't decide you which You used both, I... so it was great. Right. Well, there you go. Uh, and our third panellist, I'll just hit the microphone in a true professional style, is Amanda Higgs, who is here as the only person on the stage who knows actually how to make television and what goes, <laughs> out to, goes into it. Uh, it's a, thank God someone here is a professional. Amanda's an independent TV producer. Um, she's uh, got a 13-part series in production with the ABC at the moment that we might ask about a bit later on. Uh, but you might know her as the co-creator and producer of the first few series of The Secret Life of Us. Uh, Amanda was a script editor on the slap and uh, is I did reassure her in the green room uh, beforehand that she's not here to be the representative for all things that are wrong with Australian telly. Uh, <laughs> please make her very welcome. I make that comment about Australian telly but it has to be said that the subtitle for tonight's session was originally going to be why is Australian television so shit? Um, which is a, a little harsh. Having said I wasn't going to make you the, uh, the spokesperson for that. Um, Amanda, do you think we get television right in this country? I, I do, I do. I think we've made a lot of television um, that's connected with audiences for a long time now. It's probably that we don't make enough television. You know, we don't particularly TV drama. It's it's, um, you know, the reason that we see so much American television is because they make so much of it and we see the very, very best of it and it sells all around the world and what drives television production is how much you can sell it. And although we have quota um, content regulation in Australia, networks do not make enough television drama, for example, and that's the thing that I know about. And I think, you know, if we made more... Um, you know, we'd see more, we, we'd see more connecting with audiences, I believe. But a lot of our television absolutely connects. All of our drama often connects with big audiences and are often in the top 20 shows that are watched on TV each week. And also much more than, say, movies, for example. It's Oh, yeah, we, we could lay into the Australian film industry. We might do that another time, actually, instead of the TV industry. But the, I'm interested in that relationship between the commercial life of television and the artistic life, if we can avoid getting too pompous about it. Debbie, 
You were recently involved in the Green Guides enterprise of ranking the 25 top shows of the past 15 years? I past 25 years. 25 years. 25, 25 years. Um, did you find yourself... Um, we'll come to the difficulty of ranking and all of that in a moment, but when it came to Australian content, uh, were you marking Australian television on the same kind of standards as you were marking its American or British counterparts? Yeah, absolutely, because it would be patronising to do anything else. But I think, just as you were saying, why is Australian television so crap, maybe, and why is American television so great? There are fabulous Australian shows. There are really bad ones. There are great American shows, which perhaps we'll be focusing on tonight, but there are also a whole lot of really crappy ones. I mean... They make more than us, they're a bigger population than us. Proportionately, there's as much rubbish there as there is here probably, but we tend to celebrate the great ones, which is what we were trying to do with the, you know, the Green Guide Special Edition, and it was incredibly hard, because I, I'm the sort of person who can't decide what my favourite song is or what my favourite film is. As soon as I think of one, I think of two others that I really adore as well. And I think, well, how can I choose, you know, broadcast news when I love the big chill, for example? Here it was, well, how can I choose the West Wing and put that ahead of Frasier? And in fact, how can you compare them? And how can you decide that Mad Men is a better show than The Wire or, or Seinfeld and Friends? And I mean, you start thinking of all of them and ranking them becomes really difficult because if you love television, Television, there are a lot of shows that you really respond to and they're very different programs. Did, did people in the room see the Green Guide feature? Was there a big... How many people threw it across the room at some point <laughs> in disgust? How can that be number 17 and that be number 12? It, it, it well, is an why isn't thing. that there at all? I mean, yeah. there were some notable ones that if I'd been doing my own list perhaps would have been there that weren't in the final list. So what's the marker of truly great television, Jess? Oh, I, I just had a question. This is oh. my habit from doing breakfast. I had a question for the for the ladies, which is, we've heard that that there are some great Australian TV shows. What what are the great ones of the last couple of years? Because I can think of great television series, but it's like as soon as we get a good thing, I feel like we flog it. So Underbelly did really well. So let's make a thousand of them. You know, Underbelly, Underbelly that, the guy without the tram ticket. You know, it's. <laughs> I find it a bit, I, I find it a bit, a bit tiresome, and I want to find Australian television that I feel passionate about and that I love. But I feel like because of the con, because of the content, and maybe the way that Australian networks handle television, it's changed the way that I consume it. And the way that I consume it is, I know you used to joke about the DVD thing, but it was true. I got so sick of waiting for television networks to deliver me. TV in a weekly way, at the same time, in a way that was respectful and in order, I had to stop relying on them and just get it myself, just buy a DVD box set myself and consume television in a different way. So that's changed my relationship with network TV. So I think it's actually disconnected me from a lot of Australian television. That's a real shame. So it's a genuine question when I ask it. When you say, when you both say, there have been some great Australian shows, tell me what they are so I can, so I can get them. No, well, Amanda mightn't be able to say it, but I can say I think The Slap was terrific. I think Tangle's wonderful. I think Love My Way is exceptional. I really like Rush. I think Offspring's got good things going for it. Um, Frontline is amazing. The Hollow Men was terrific. I mean, there are a lot of good programs. Yeah, they were programs. all the things that are on my list, definitely. I mean, I think We Can Be Heroes was fantastic. I loved yep. that show. I think anything... Mm. Like all those shows that you mentioned, Debbie, I think were all shows that were trying to do something different too mm. and try and... Um, look at the market, which is what you should be doing as a producer, and find your gap in the market and try and play to that. But, but I think what you're talking about, Jess, is that a commercial network has a hit with something and then it's popular and they think the audience want more, and often they do. Mm. So, and the fact that, um, I mean, Underbelly is still rating, so, and it's sort of defined Channel 9's drama, mm. and now they're doing other things. They'll be hard so. pushed to come up with another series of Beaconsfield, I think. That's, <laughs> that's fine. They have to stick them back down the hole, which seems a bit Well, they unkind. made it out, so they might be able to. I'm kind of curious about whether something like Freeview is exciting to people that make... Australian television, because I know when I'm in the UK, they have so many channels there that it seems that anyone can kind of get a show made, even if you've got, you know, like, there's so much 
opportunity to have stuff broadcast because there's so many different channels and there's something three it's like the, the third best version of that channel but it gives stuff like Gavin and Stacey which started off I think on like BBC three or something a chance to find an audience to get that word of mouth going and then the BBC go hang on we've got something that's really good let's put it on the main channel and I'm wondering when, when that's going to start happening for Australian television when productions are going to get on on smaller channels find an audience, have time to get legs without losing ratings and getting axed straight away and then move over. It's about money. It's just about money and what, um, like, those other channels have got to spend on content. So once... If things start working, then I think you'll get more money and more content will develop. Hopefully that's the idea. That, uh, that, is, uh, that is, I guess, what I was touching upon when I was talking about the relationship between the commercial and the art. Is that, uh, Are there enough opportunities to fail or to be wildly experimental? Amanda, you pointed towards one of the strengths of those shows you were listing as being the ones that were trying to do something different and, mm. and break a mould. Um, when you're a slave to commercial realities, that must be harder. It is really hard, and I think, I think Debbie's right. There's so much American content that what we tend to respond to are the things that feel truly visionary and have a lot of money spent on them. Mm. So... I mean, what's difficult in Australia is that the numbers don't add up commercially. So you're always you're not making um, drama programs for anywhere near the same amount as the American shows. So you are having to think, how can you cut your cloth? And someone like Chris Lilly, I think, did it perfectly with his shows. And I know he got more money based on um, the success of his shows. But I think We Can Be Heroes was a pretty low budget show, and it did phenomenally well. So. There are always gaps in the market and then there, are always, there is always commercial conservatism to rail against that. And I think you've got to try and have a vision if you're a program maker and just keep trying to find that gap in the market. It does seem interesting to me that the, the government funding for screen culture doesn't tend to happen through the arts. It tends to happen through industry and through innovation rather than... It's not actually funded in the same way that other art forms, say, literature, mm. are. Do you think that has an effect? Do you think that there's an expectation of uh, commercial output being the kind of primary objective and primary marker of success? It, um, are we don't bag the funding oh, body. Uh, that's, uh, that that's would be hard. a mistake. I don't know. If we're talking about American television, <sighs> absolutely not. It's, all, it's just a huge business over there. So... Everything is... It, well, there's pilot season, you know, it's so competitive. There's probably, um, you know, and maybe up to 20 pilots that are funded for about... I mean, I was in America doing an internship a long time ago now, but it was about a million dollars a pilot. And then it's that thing where they... Then there's just cut after cut after cut and you end up with maybe three shows that go into a first season and that might be only seven episodes. There's a mid-season pick-up and you might go to 13, you might go to 22. So it's very commercially driven over there. Um, whereas here, well, it's ABC or commercial television. So... Do the three of you accept that American TV is going through an extraordinary period of success, that creatively it's as rich as it's ever been? I think it has been an extraordinary period. I mean, it's been called a golden age, and I think there's good reason to think that when you look at the sort of drama series we've seen in the last 10 years. I think a lot of it's been driven by the cable channels. I think, you know, we we're talking about the size of the, the amount of money, I mean, the size of the population. You've got cable channels appealing to a niche market, hoping to get subscriptions. A niche market there is 10 million viewers, say. Um, you know, you've got a population of, what, 200 million. Here, for a program to succeed, maybe it gets a million viewers there. You can afford to have an HBO program that gets 10 million viewers. And we've seen really innovative choices being made by channels like HBO and Showtime and FX because they don't have to pander to advertisers, they don't have to appease lobby groups, so they can take risks and there's really ambitious, innovative programming, creative storytelling, flawed, multi-dimensional characters that are really edgy compared to what you see on network television. All of that's meant, you know, opportunities for really great storytellers. I put a DVD in the other day and it was from kind of midway through last decade and there was an HBO station promo at the start of it, and it just had a roll call of the shows that they had on the network at that time. And it was uh, Six Feet Under, The Sopranos, yeah. Deadwood, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Wire, 
um, Sex and the City. I mean, it was this run of shows that uh, any network would be proud to put their name to, and they were doing them all at the same time. What happened? Did they change the business model? Oh, I, I, was, I was actually looking into, like, wh why today, I was thinking about why the shows have sort of changed as well in the last, like, maybe 20, 20 years, the style of show that, that, that is really successful in America. And I, it's because, I guess, uh, the narrative storytelling that, that goes through it... That, we're getting shows that are kind of like ongoing movies. Like the quality of the, the writing, and, and there was a theory that, that it might be because a lot of the people that were responsible for these television shows also had backgrounds in film. So people like Alan Ball, who did American Beauty, was then doing Six Feet Under. And so there's just lots of beautiful storytelling, and it, 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 wasn't, it sort of changed from that world of just sitcoms or, or police serials or all those kinds of shows, and they were just like ongoing movies, and, I, and I, I love them. But the one thing that I was just thinking when you were naming all the HBO shows, um, there's one show that I, I, it took me a couple of seasons to have this coin drop moment that I went, no one's swearing. And that's when I realised it, it was, wasn't cable. And it's Friday Night Lights. And I think that has mm. been like a, st a, a really... I, do, you, do you not like it? <laughs> I love it. Oh. <laughs> Come on, boy. Wow. I was thinking you were doing a television laugh of you no, idiot. No, None of us no, in no, the industry. No, no, like no, it. So it. can I just check? Is everyone in the room happy if we turn the discussion into all about Friday Night Lights from here on in? <laughs> because I, I don't know, but I'd, I'd be all right with it. Yeah, but I mean, there, there's a show that, that was so incredible and it, t it told a really important... Like, when someone told me you should watch this show, it's about American high school football players, I could not have looked less interested. And Tim Riggins is you just... Know? You know, he's dreamy. <laughs> he is. He's a beautiful man. But the, look, the, to be honest, like, I, I just thought, yeah, right, I'm going to watch a show about football. But obviously it's so much more and it, talk, and it talks about, I guess, the class system and what it's like to be in rural areas of the US and, and why it's so important to suddenly be a football star. So that gets you that scholarship, that gets you to college. It got me thinking so much about, about like, like, social standings and stuff like that in, in the US. And it really took a couple of seasons till I went, no one's swearing. And that's when I realised it was NBC. And, I mean, I think it's this one miracle show that has that quality of, of cable television shows that's been done for a network TV show. And in the end, I think they had to do a deal with a distribution Direct service. TV. Direct um, TV. In order to do the last series or two. two, I think. Yeah. Um, but still, what a miracle that we got that. But uh, that is an interesting thing, is that, uh, I mean, it is a relatively unique example, but there are others. The West Wing was on... Um, you know, primetime NBC. Uh, What's that? The Arrested mm. Development was on Fox, on free to air television, one of the more subversive, ridiculous, off the wall uh, television programs you can imagine. There seems to be that capacity on, on free to air television in the US for the genuinely experimental and the genuinely <laughs> out there. Do you? Mm. I don't know. I think when I look at the network shows of the moment that I think are. Uh, you know, really terrific. It's stuff like, say, The Good Wife or 30 Rock, maybe Community. Um, but I think the stuff that tends to be more innovative and push the envelope a bit more is on cable rather than... I, I generally think network seems to be safer. Uh, they can do a great classic legal, legal series like The Good Wife really well. And Friday Night Lights, I remember reading about when it was on, they kept giving it these terrible time slots and like almost from the time it started is this every, in the US or in Australia? In the US yeah. almost from the time it started it was like oh it's not going to make it, oh it's lucky to get to the end of the first season, oh they've stuck it on a I think they stuck it on a Friday night yeah. which was like a dead zone and at the end of every season it was only saved by um, viewer campaigns and critical acclaim, it was like it was on the precipice through its whole life mm. and it, was, it must be shocking for the people making it, they're making something so fantastic, yeah. they've got such a great cast it's such a well-made show. It's so kind of imaginative in the way they've made it, and it's on the edge of not being there every season. Mm. It, it would be solid. The upside is you'd go home and look in the mirror and be Tim Riggins still. So <laughs> swings and roundabouts, I think, there. But, yes, it would be heartbreaking. Uh, but it's a show that's really never been on air really in Australia in no. any significant way as have a lot of these shows that we're talking about. They've yeah. not been on free-to-air in prime well, time. That was going to be my, my question. And while the session's being filmed, so the people on the stage aren't going to put their hands up for this, you and the audience aren't being filmed right now. Show of hands, how many people illegally download their television that they watch? Wow. 
for the camera, none, which is good. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, our model of watching television has changed. Mm. Jess, you talked about it with DVDs. I talked about it with DVDs. (laughs) You're absolutely right, Michael. I was buying box sets once a week as the box sets were released in the US. Um, And I feel bad about that. If I could get it, if I could buy it. I don't feel bad about anything because I've done nothing wrong. But (laughs) hypothetically, (laughs) if I had done something wrong and illegally downloaded shows, I mean, I I can't get them through, I don't think, Australian versions of uh, of iTunes and things like that. I can't purchase American television shows unless I have an American credit card and I'm set up in the States. They make it very difficult for me to get my hands on great television unless I either am getting my hands on box sets when the whole series is kind of done Mm. or I'm getting my hands on it in other ways. Um, but I like to think that I was spreading the word about the shows, so maybe that was helpful. Yeah, sure. Tell yeah. yourself that. But you guys maybe used to make fun of me because Michael was a breakfaster when I was doing television reviews on breakfasters and, and used to tease me about always doing shows that had box sets. But, I mean, there was a reason for it and some of the best television that is being made at the moment is not being aired in Australia or not being aired to the audience that it deserves and instead being Lara Bingle's being made. Or not getting... <laughs> Harsh. Um, <laughs> or not getting a regular time slot. No, that's the other thing. That's the other crime. But, but that was the great um, thing when The Sopranos came back, and I can't remember what season it was, Debbie, but you'll probably know when Channel 9 said we're premiering the next season, the next season of The Sopranos because the wave had... You know, the mm. Sopranos wave had taken hold, and then they put the previous season on, and I think everyone just rang up Channel Nine yeah. and complained, mm. and and I think it was the first time I thought, yeah, you have absolutely no respect for mm. the audience because that, you had yeah. promoted it, knowing that everyone was hanging on this show. Mm. So it was a disaster. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, they bounced West Wing around appallingly. Everywhere, just, everywhere. It was. It just I mean, showed. And Buffy on Channel Seven. Yeah. I mean, there are a whole lot of those shows that we would think would be right up there in the best shows mm. of the last decade that were treated. Horribly Horribly by commercial That's TV. That's what fascinates me. You can't turn like, the television on without seeing an episode of The Big Bang Theory. Yeah. And yet 30 Rock, maybe if you're lucky, two in the morning on Channel 7 one night. And on then a Tuesday by the at 11.30 week. or something. I protested yeah. about Desperate Housewives. And in retrospect, I'm kind of glad I did. But at, at the time, you know, remember that hype about Desperate Housewives? And uh, Except I'm really over the voiceover in all the... Dexter, everything like... My, my dark passenger is shut up Dexter's dark passenger <laughs> shut up and I, you know I couldn't help but wonder the Sex and the City one and the Desperate Housewives one is in Wisteria Lane <laughs> some secrets can't shut up like I get so over it we don't need you to tell me everything but, but at the time I was swept up in Desperate Housewives fever because it had been shoved down our throats for about two months in advance and so I watched the first episode and I was like yeah okay second episode yeah okay third episode yeah okay they have a ratings hit so then they have Two week break before we're going to come back with some new Desperate Housewives. We've got to have a two week break because something's on the tennis or whatever. We'll come back, we might play an old episode, and then we'll go another pause, and then we'll play a new episode. But then the next week, we might play an old episode instead of the new episode you're expecting because we know you're probably going to watch it anyway because you're coming in for the new. By the time they bounced it around three or four times, I thought, you've, I, I'm actually never going to watch this show in protest of the way that you've treated me as a new viewer, just assuming that because it's a hype show that I have to go along with it. And what's come to bite them is that in the, in the years that have followed with other different shows, you treat a viewer like that and a viewer will react by doing what some people hypothetically do. And we well, you know what, I'll just get it straight from the US and I don't need you. And you wonder where your ratings go. But what? now there's stop. Now there's so much pressure on networks to get stuff as soon as it's and been great. on air in America. They're ten years late on discovering the internet, but also yeah. no, I know. It's like Kathy Lett making I... a pun and thinking that no one's ever heard it before because you know we're all regional. We go, Kathy, you've got eight eight lines and you've used them all several times around the world. We've, you know, but yeah, network t- TV's found the internet and they kind of understand that they have to do it, which is great. But why, why are they so bad at encouraging viewer loyalty? You would think that that's a fairly simple formula, is show something at the same time every week and mm. you'll build a following. Why, why? Surely there's something to be said in the way imported television is treated in this country that makes it even harder for local television to have a relationship with it, to, be, to have viewers who are educated in a particular kind of TV watching. No, you don't want to go on? Is there, oh, I, mean, look, I, I don't get it. It's mystifying. I, mean, I don't understand it. I think they've shown contempt for their audience for a long time and I don't understand it because, you know, there are m- many more options for the audience to pursue. They've got pay TV, they've got the net. 
and when they get a program like a Desperate Housewives, for example, that's a huge hit, even if you do try and follow it through, it started 10 minutes late, this isn't the, you know, it's suddenly a repeat episode, it's gone for two weeks. If you then try and watch it, they pack it so full of ads after the first 10 minutes that it's unwatchable. I mean, one of the perks of the job that I do has been getting preview discs. So a lot of the shows that I love, I haven't had to watch with ads. <laughs> but the stuff I do watch that's live to air, I always record it. I record it, I add 10 or 15, you know, the plus 20 minutes at the end to make sure I don't miss the end because it always starts late and it always finishes late. And then I watch it so that I can spool through the ads because it's unbearable otherwise. Is it like, is it the quality of Australian TV to compete with that? Because I, I'm actually remembering, because you were responsible for Secret Life of Us. And I remember when that started and how obsessed I was with it. Like, we, it became a thing that we would get together on those nights and watch Secret Life of Us, my best friend and I. We, everyone did it. It was, it was just a real phenomenon, that, that show. How did you manage to nail that? Well, can I say that if we were making that show now, we would, we would, not, have, we would not have survived the first series because what were the, ratings like? the ratings were good on the first night because we came out of Big Brother and yes, so like I maybe I can't I was overseas the intruders time, went in that night I think I it was about <laughs> I think it was about like maybe 1.2 we started out I don't know what we ended at but the second week we were 600,000 now really in this climate we would have been gone because it took us they said to us the one show you cannot go up against is Sex in the City exactly the same audience and that was Monday night at 9.30. Now, I'd seen my own show, so I could watch Sex and the City for the next six weeks until it finished, <laughs> and it wasn't until then that Secret Life, sort of, the numbers built. But now, we, we wouldn't have survived. We, like, that's, that would be... We just saw what happened on that dance show in Channel 10. I mean, it was gone within three weeks. Did it survive three weeks? I mean, two, two weeks. I mean, gone. The posters on the tram like, lasted longer than the show did. Like, you know, that's, that's By the that sort dance of, show, do you mean George Negus tonight? Because <laughs> <laughs> I never saw any episodes, but I understand it's very good. <laughs> that's he the can do anything. environment that we're living in. So, you know, we were lucky. We were just really lucky. So. Right. I'm, I'm going to ask you, we're being terribly restrained and critically engaged at the moment, but uh, I'm going to ask you to give over to a moment of embarrassing fanishness uh, and ask each of you to... I, I won't ask you to boil it down to one, but maybe three particular bits of American television that you would like to uh, pay tribute to. Mm. Three. It's brutal. I, we were backstage. We were discussing this and discussing okay. the narrowing down of it is very hard. I tried to do a list of five myself, and I came up with Arrested Development, uh, Deadwood, uh, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, and uh, then I started to get a bit panicky about only having one slot left, <laughs> and all the ones that I forgot. The Wire obviously had to be there, but then what about The Sopranos, and what about the 90 other things that I'd forgotten? So I, I, instead of putting the pressure on these three to ask them to come up with five, I've asked them to come up with three. <laughs> OK. Um, because I had to go through this process, agonising though it was quite recently, to submit my Green Guide list, I think my top three were... Um, West Wing, Frasier, and My So-Called Life. Oh, excellent. Interesting choice. But then, what about... Yeah, so it, it was a really difficult process. Well, then, My, my So-Called Life. Yeah. Claire Danes. Yeah. And the curly-haired blonde guy. Jordan yeah, Catalano. Was, no, no, he no, was the hottie. He oh, was yeah. Brian... Brian... Krawitz. Oh, yeah. Next door. Yeah. Was it really that good? Oh, sensational. Or was it just of its moment? <laughs> It's it. We actually does it stand the test of time. Yes, it does. Yeah, just go. go and, and we get it. we watched it again quite recently, and it's magnificent. And it only lasted seventeen episodes. And it, you know, it's the people who made thirty something, and well, now and again, and they know how to make television. Well, that's an exceptional one out of your three because it did have a shortened lifespan. But what yeah. happens when a show outlives its glory days a bit? I noticed two in your top three, arguably. Uh, had weaker series as well as stronger ones. Does that Which one was weaker? Yeah. <laughs> Which one do you think was weaker? Do you weaker? think Frasier was good all the way through? Yes. Oh, do you think the West Wing episode. was good all the way through? It, every, it's a joy. Yeah. Every time. Wow. Yeah. We still watch Look it that. That's repeatedly. Nice. Yeah. It's on TV One. Anytime there's an episode on, I have to watch it. You've gone it. all starry-eyed. I love it. <laughs> well, I just think it's a Well, you're not going to defend season five of The West Wing for me, are you? I'm gonna, I would defend every season of The West Wing. Wow. Oh, but you, but, oh, but there, are, there are slightly dicey seasons. 
season is in each one. And that was the one that Aaron Sorkin had run off, wasn't it? Season five. But John mm. Wells did so well. I just, I think... He Even when really Josh was shouting at the Capitol building, you want a piece of me? That was embarrassing. I will not hear a word against Josh. Okay, excellent. Not a word. Josh Lyman, apologist. That's true fandom. Yes, That's is. excellent. It Jess is. McGuire, your three? Uh, I can't pick three, so I'll just name three that I like. Cause I, and I won't say that these are definitive and they'll change, as my favourite songs do, as you through say. Through the session? <laughs> through the session. Um, I, look, I really love 30 Rock. I really, really love it. 30 Rock is a show that I have... That I watch when I go to sleep sometimes. I, I, I know the episodes backwards. I've watched each episode probably at least five or six times. Um, and I really love it and I always get new jokes from it. And, and I, I just am obsessed with the writing and the humour and the pop culture and it appeals to everything like that in me. But I will also say that 30 Rock could have ended at the end of season three and it would have been perfect. And there is, I'm not saying I don't like episodes in four, five, and six, but it could have ended at, the end, at season three, and I would have been like brilliant, done, box set, gold. Um, but it didn't, and I feel like it's sort of at, at a point where it becomes a little bit of a caricature of what it was. It's still better than most things on television, as far as I'm concerned, as far as sitcoms go. But, but yeah, it, it could easily have finished. And there's a few shows like that that I think, yeah, good, but could have wound it out a bit. But um, I, I love. Um, Six Feet Under is, is a series that I really loved. And I watched that all in a row. I, I went through, you were right, that's how I was doing my reviews, just inhaling box sets at one time. So I would absorb a TV show in a, in a two-week period and just live it. And that's exactly how I did so five seasons, possibly six, I can't remember, of um, Six Feet Under. But I just lived it. All, I worked from home, worked. So I was like, <laughs> and I was a smoker then Pretty and all the energy stuff. drinks. And I really was just spending every... <laughs> so I did The Sopranos too. I had a lot of confused dreams. But, but with Six Feet Under, what, a, what a, an amazing tale. You had to watch that all the way through as uh, in a row, I think, to appreciate it. Because I know people that go, yeah, I watched it occasionally when it was on the television. No, you watch that from beginning to end. And what flawed characters that, that, that you want to shake them and go, you idiot, like, why would you make that decision? But isn't there everyone in life that you have those moments where you go, you idiot, why would you make that decision? And I still would rate the finale for Six mm-hmm. Feet Under. I have not cried so hard in my life. I cared about every single one of those characters. You know, that's the first time anyone's ever applauded for something with such bad old person makeup. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got to say it. Um, it, it was terrible, <laughs> but see as breathe me. Oh, you know, and it was just, I, I just could have, stick a fork in me, I'm done. I loved it. Um, I loved Buffy. I sometimes wonder whether Buffy um, stands the test of time as much. I still do love it. I haven't watched it in many years, but I was obsessed with it and would be home on a Tuesday night by 10.30 every night. I was gr- so upset when I moved to the UK for about a six-month period uh, when it was going into season four. So it would have been the year 2000. That was when it was being broadcast in Australia. And the internet was just booming at the time. And a co-worker said, I hear Willow becomes a lesbian. And I was like, you're an idiot. <laughs> But I'm going overseas and I won't find out. And I had to go back to just videotapes stacked up that I'd made people tape for me all the time and just inhale a whole series of it. I don't know if it would be as good as it was or... No, not as good, but if it could ever mean as much to me in re-watching it now because I'm not the person that I was. And Buffy was the exact same age as me. Uh, I know from her tombstone. And, and I was... I was <laughs> I was in year 11 when she was in year 11 and that's when I would stay up late and mum wasn't monitoring the TV in the back room so I could go and watch Buffy pretty late and I, and I was watching every week and I bought the books and I got the, the merch and I loved that show. I'll, I don't know that I'll be able to love another show as much as I did love Buffy at the time but I don't watch it anymore and I don't go back and watch it so it's strange. Bugger American TV. We're doing a session next week on Jess McGuire's Psyche uh, that you should come along to that I think... Some scary insights. Well, thanks, Michael. It's always good to be here with you in the the (laughs) centre. Amanda? Um, I think probably I'd have to say Mad Men recently. Just, um, it's so, I I would love to know, I'd love to meet Matthew Weiner and get inside his brain. I think it's a show that has created such a flawed central character, a man played by a very, very good-looking actor, that you just watch him kind of go through his life and I think 
Matthew Weiner is the great champion of the random event or the random act or the sort of like there was um, a moment when I was watching the last series where Don Draper I think has just said goodbye to his wife and then he goes to the lift well and the doors open mm-hmm. and all you can see is the lift shaft and he looks down and he steps away and you think oh my god I love you I don't know what made you think of doing that mm. but I love that you did it and I love that no one cut it out and no one challenged it and no one said what does it mean and it meant so much but also it was just this tiny 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 moment in a you know a brilliant mm. series and I think if you tried to do that in Australia you would never be allowed to do it I maybe think- on cable maybe I think things like Tangle mm. have come close for me um but, yeah, it, it's just that, that ability to be really pure about your storytelling, one so of the things, pure. Uh, one of the things I love about Mad Men is that so much of TV has that impulse about restoring the status quo at the end mm. of an episode or at the mm. end of a series, and Mad Men's really unsettling because you spend most of the time watching it, waiting for it to get back to normal. When are mm. they going to get back to... And, and actually the show resists that mm. kind of viewing. It's mm. about mm. change and it's about forward mm. momentum. And it's, mm. Sorry, I got a bit distracted. No, you know, no, it's OK. It's one of your three. Um, I think Deadwood... I tend to latch on to people who create shows to... Um, so I watched, you know, NYPD Blue slavishly. I thought it was just a, a brilliant show of its time. Um, Is that Dennis Franz's bum? <laughs> or Ricky Schroeder's. <laughs> and, and, and look, I'd love the first two series and the third series didn't fly as much for me, but um, I love the poetic language of the show and that you could create a world where the moral compass was really clear. Like, I think... Um, and I've just forgotten the creator's name. Isn't that terrible? Because my memory so... Um, Stephen Bochco. No, um, David Deadwood, Milch. David Milch. Milch. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because it, you know he's a poet and he's, you know, he's an academic and all those things. And I think he's so clever with language and character and setting a world and, and, and really splitting the difference between... Um, what's good and bad he's so morally ambiguous and it's beautiful like I think he's a wonderful writer and even he wrote this show called um, um, John from Cincinnati did you ever see that it was the weirdest (laughs) show I watched all 13 episodes I couldn't I couldn't stop it was did you watch watch the Bochco I couldn't understand a single thing of what was going on it's a Bochco series I can't remember what it's called but it's like musical cop or something cop rock yeah 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 Yeah, Yeah. the musical police procedural everything you need to know is in the name there (laughs) can I just say I'm now feeling shocking that I left Mad Men off my top three it's already started but oh no that's upsetting I feel that about the wire I feel that way about cop rock. I mean, there's so many shows. (laughs) But I also think, like, a show that really changed the way um, I watched TV was Sex in the City because it was a half-hour show and I'm desperate for Australian broadcasters to um, start with a half-hour, the narrative half-hour, not comedy, but true, like, the Americans do, really, and they make so many great half-hour shows. And I think if you look at the arc of that show, that you... You can travel a character, for example, like um, Kristen Davis's character, from marrying the perfect man who's the doctor who's impotent, who can't have a baby, to falling, to having sort of random sex with a Jewish law- lawyer, then converting. And the one thing that she thought she wanted was definitely not the thing that she needed by the end of the show. Like, she sort of found happiness and all the... You know, it's, they constructed these relationships for these women beautifully and you felt like, one, you, you sort of knew a version of all those women or you wanted to be friends with them or you were just... It was just great to be celebrating something that was so frank, really. Amanda, do you think that the legacy of that show has been tainted by the movies? No. I loved the first movie. The second movie... <laughs> It was hard, but I think they had too much money and it went really quickly. I think it it went into development and shooting really quickly. I would love to talk to Michael Patrick King about the... Because I think he's genius. I think he's a wonderful writer and director and he steered that show so beautifully through all the seasons. It's easy to forget what an impact that show had and and what the television landscape was like 
at the time to then yeah. put just a show about four women. Yeah, and, and it's beautifully plotted. Like what the Americans do so well is plot. They do character really well, but they do plot fantastically. I think every show that we love has great plot. I think Aiden comes up a bit too often, but that's just me. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> no. uh, I, uh, one of the <laughs> recurring themes out of the shows that you all identify, though, is the auteur. You, mm. You're all able to you know, say whether it's you know, Milch or, mm. or whether it's Whedon or whether it's Sorkin or whoever it is, there is a prevailing culture in American TV of being able to point at a TV show that we love and say, that's because this person was behind it's the it. Show, it's the showrunner. Well, well Jason it? Caddams is Friday Night Lights and he's now doing Parenthood. I mean, I don't think that guy can write his own ticket now. But these guys get these huge, and women, but I can't think of any women off the top of my head. Lena um, Dunham now? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, girls, yeah, girls Amy maybe. Amy Schoen, uh, yeah. Gilmore Girls. Tina I'm Gilmore sorry, girls. unashamed, total Gilmore Girls fan. Yep, like, ditto. really unashamed. Mm. Beautiful. Now we're starting to get panicky about not mentioning things. <laughs> um, uh, just but, so you know, in about two or three minutes, uh, a couple of our ushers have microphones. We're going to take questions from the floor. Normally we say we want questions, not statements. But the more rabid and fanish <laughs> the statements today, the better. So if you feel that we've just neglected a classic of American TV, <laughs> save it up and tell us. Well, don't save it up, just tell us. That's, that's right. I think that showrunner thing is absolutely critical because it, in the States, the, the people who run the shows are writers. I mean, they, they're doing a producer role, they get a producer credit, but they're the people who've created the series. So you get Matthew Weiner doing Mad Men and you get um, Vince Gilligan doing Breaking Bad and uh, David Chase and David Simon. And they're, they've got the creative considerations right up there with the financial ones and they protect their vision for the show. Whereas here you talk to Australian writers and they feel unrewarded, unrecognised, like at the wrap party at the end of the first season shoot, nobody in the cast and crew knows who they are, who's this weird person, they don't want them on the set. Writers there are revered, they're paid well, not that they don't have their battles, I mean, Matthew Wynne mm. had to fight like crazy, it seems absurd now to think about it, to get John Hamm to play the lead because Lionsgate didn't think he was good looking enough. <laughs> You know, I mean, wow. couldn't agree more. He had, he, it's not like they don't have their battles, but they're not the guys who came up from sales and think that the future of the network is in reality TV and infotainment. They're people who really preserve the core, the heart and soul of their show, and they try to keep that going while they're trying to make all the budgets work and the sales and everything. Except they, in reality, just because I did an, an attachment there years ago, like mm. looking, I want to go and look at how they wrote American television and why it was so good and they just they have all these people who run all the money and they have so mm. much money because mm. I heard this crazy story that David Milch like had all his per diems on Deadwood which were thousands of dollars a week which he was literally giving away to the crew at the end of the week because they have so much money and someone said oh do you go um, over budget and over schedule he said do you go over budget and he said no, no, no. And then someone said, do you go over schedule? And he goes, yeah, all the time. Well, that's going over budget. So it's just that they have, you know, yes, they have a budget, but I also think they have so much money mm. and they get, you know, Matthew Weiner can argue a better position now. Famously, so, Milch is so difficult to work with. I think it was probably hush money but, for most of the but crew. But the thing that they do have is writers are on staff. They're on staff. They're well paid. You're not competing with the freelance model that you are here where you're kind of grabbing writers and they have to work on a, on a million different shows to earn a living. They're only doing one show and mm. so I think therefore or you've got to get a better product because that's all they're thinking about. That's all they're doing. That's all that, that's their job, and they're paid really well to do it. So mm. I think it's just mm. a different. It's just a different model. I just so. want to be an extra on the show where the guy hands out thousands of dollars at the end of the week. I think you get shouted at first and have to sit in poo. If Call it's me whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> Now, there are microphones either side. We can obviously happily keep talking if you're too shy, but I bet you there's someone there who's going to say. Why haven't you mentioned dot, dot, dot? I was just wondering, were, was there any show that you think ran far too long? For example, Veronica Mars. Brilliant first season, 
second season, not so great. Third season, just kill no, I shouldn't watch it. Can I love the first dead. season. Finished the second season recently. Can I just say that was a textbook third. piece of prejudice question asking? <laughs> <laughs> that is just gold. I'm interested that one season may be way, way too long. You've got something like The X Files, which arguably mm. our status welcome by about three seasons. Mm. I think Community could have finished at the end of season two, and I love that show as well. But that's another show that had, it's got so many brilliant moments that I remember when I fell in love with Community, it was at the beginning of the year. I hadn't watched it before. And when, I, when you fall for Community, if you're a Community fan, you really fall for it and you suddenly go, oh, my God. Um. <laughs> and then it got... I hope there's a transcript of this. Um, <laughs> then it got to the end of season two and I was like, right, season three, let's do it. And there are a couple of moments, but I thought, oh, this show's kind of lost and, and again, has become that thing where it's almost like if you'd hired someone to say, can you write a show like Community? And they weren't quite getting there. And it's almost like they ran out of story to do about college because it's set at a community college, if you're not aware. And so the storylines became more and more outlandish and unrealistic. And I think it was to the detriment of some... I mean, it was lovable and a bit surreal, but it was still kind of... See, I thought it normal. hit its really crazy stride in season three. But that's just... Yeah, no, oh, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, I think it got really crazy in season three. But uh, to me, I think could have ended it at season two and you would have had a great two seasons. And they fired him anyway, Dan Harmon, from his own show. Mm. He was apparently quite difficult and losing the vision for his show anyway. Ending things is famously difficult. Um, mm. And it can be the difference between you remembering a show fondly or uh, not fondly. Twin Lost. Peaks. Twin Peaks. Um, Lost is one that uh, the, the horror the fans felt about the final ending. Can you think of uh, what's the most perfectly ended TV show you can think of? Seinfeld, maybe? was genius. Hmm. Sopranos. I'm a big fan it's of Sopranos, the Sopranos me too. ending. I thought the ending was great. I think it's magnificent. It was great. Yeah. But I think the thing is with... it's so Even with that population and all that money, even in the States, it's so hard to get a program up. Definitely. It's so competitive. It's so amazing if they make it through pilot season onto a first season, they keep it going. So many people are invested in it by the time it's up and running. It's so hard for everyone to wind it up. There's always the temptation to try one more season because if it's working and you've done three or four and everyone is comfortable with it and it's running along and it's got a spot in the schedule and people are going to it, even if it's you know not quite what it was, there's this real temptation to keep it going. I think Desperate Housewives went too long. Mm. I pay tribute to The Shield, which ended so well that it would bump up several slots in my list mm. of... And that was partly down to the ending. I think yeah. the American... The, the kind of trend of TV series that were about anti-heroes created an extra pressure on how to end it because the question was, how do you, having had a complex relationship with your central character, how do you do justice to that complexity in, in however they finish up? I don't know how I want Breaking Bad to end, but it makes me upset thinking about <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I, my, I guess mine was sort of the opposite to that, which was shows that were cancelled far, far too early. My example would be Firefly. It's oh, good. There's a firefly. It's <laughs> actually happy. There's always one in every one in one hundred people is a closeted firefly fan. One on any tram. <laughs> I mean, that, was a, that was a coat. great show. I mean, Joss Whedon is he's good. He's a good he's a good writer. I don't know why his stuff doesn't last, but it just kind of doesn't. He has a really great ability, from what I can tell, to write a show that will attract just enough people to have a completely batshit crazy fan base but not enough to have enough viewers to keep it going on air. <laughs> but the ones that he does have, which aren't enough, are really into it. You know, but it was great. But, yeah, I mean, they, I never saw them... I don't think I saw the movie that they did afterwards, Serenity, was it? Yeah? Um, I didn't see the movie that they did to try and wind things up, but I can understand that it would probably need to. But I think we were talking before about how Australian TV networks are contemptuous of their audience and how they muck up the programming. I think I'm remembering right that when they started Firefly in the States, they started from episode three because they thought it was a stronger episode. So they actually, when they screened it, didn't start it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever a death sentence hanging over a show, it's like, don't show them the first episode so you know who everyone is on the spaceship and what their relationships are. Start with the one that's a western and a train heist. Probably what a great more idea. action in episode three. Yeah. So they thought maybe they'd do that first. I think my so-called 
called life. But then I wonder then if, if it yeah. would be sort of the cult hit that it is, had it gone on and been, you know, subsequently mm. three or four series. I think it's sort of a perfect series. Freaks and Geeks. Freaks and Geeks, I was about to say. Freaks and Geeks. Too short. Very yeah. unlucky. Yeah. Um, there's a really good sitcom called Better Off Ted that just slipped through the yeah. gaps completely and that was only kind of yeah yeah, Yeah. only kind of 12 or 13 episodes i think and that was there was a very obscure little show called wonderfalls that was made that they just did one series which i was addicted to and so sad they didn't make it had a great premise it was about yeah a a woman working in a souvenir shop where all the little uh things came to life and and told her like she was a very cynical young woman and they, the things that they told her to do were about being a better person. Mm. <laughs> it was quite funny. <laughs> and Pushing Daisies. I was a big fan same, of Pushing so, Daisies. Uh, so the same creators did Pushing ah. Daisies. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's what reminded yeah. me. It's sort of whimsical. Yeah. Very mm. whimsical. Pushing Daisies was beautiful. Yeah. That was like Tim Burton yeah. doing a TV show. Yeah. It was only noise. without Johnny yeah. Depp and uh, Helena Bonham <laughs> Carter. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, and then you, they had to wrap that show up. It felt like, like in the last three minutes of the show. Literally, the last three minutes of the final episode was something like, blah, 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 blah. And it did feel slightly right. I'm just trying not to do any spoilers if you've not watched Pushing Daisies. But that was one I really loved as well, actually. Mm. You're right. And if you understand mine, though, that was spoiled for you then. The, that was something. <laughs> Oh, can I just first say thanks for mentioning Wonderfalls? I was starting to think that I'd imagined it existed. Um, but what role do you think the sort of increased competition in the US plays in the quality of the work that they produce? Do we have less competition or more? I think it's the same. It's just that they're, uh, you know, we're just on a smaller scale. I think there's no less competition. And I think the only thing I think we, we don't do here is have more vision and be more bold. I think sometimes we we think too much. Um, I know commercial networks, you know, they're big businesses. Um, but I think sometimes if you know, if you just came up with a wackiest idea that felt really true and real, and tried to think about the zeitgeist and what might be next, you might hit on something fabulous rather than just trying to think. Well, okay, someone had a hit with that. We should do something similar to that. I think we. I think sometimes we lack a bit of vision, and I, and I think the cable channels are pushing the envelope. But I'd love to see them spend more money. Yes, um, I wonder if you could comment what you think the success of American TV says about the operation of the free market in culture and entertainment. Um, you've got this enormous inflow of talent and creativity. Um, you know, we, it, you get this products made for people all around the world who can enjoy it. It's made for uh, it's made for the market, um, and you know, wouldn't should that should those? I'm just wondering. You know, it's a common question. Should those principles, or can that can they work in other art forms as well, or or is is that testament to the free market working there, or is, are there shortcomings in that? I didn't go to uni, so I'm going to pass this over to (laughs) anyone else. Uh, I think we're a small market with a small population and we need to protect our local industry. And I think the evidence is, as we've seen with the the pay TV networks, unless networks are forced to invest in local drama, it's expensive, they won't do it, they'll go for cheaper options. So I am all in favour of great American shows coming in, but I think if we want to have a vibrant industry, it needs to be protected and nurtured and supported, and I, and I think it should be. Do you think if enough cheap shows... Yeah, that's good, that's worth it. <laughs> Do you think if enough cheap shows fail that they might change? Because, I mean, the, the, well, the, sh- the Shire and being Lara Bingle have not... Have not Lara, being Lara Bingle last... Uh, the, they're they're not doing well, and I think that gives you faith in the yeah. world. Because then they could just combine those budgets and kind of make an OK show at least. And I, then suspect, maybe watch I suspect it. they're not as cheap as you think they are, Jess. That's, really? that's the Why problem. Why do they look so bad? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, I think they're probably not as... I mean, I'd love to know, but 
why can I not think of that dance show on Channel 10? Is it Everybody it, dance, dance Now? Thank you, whatever it was. Also a terrible now, title. A terrible title, why I can't remember. I'll tell you what, though, I'm pleased to have heard you say it on a no, stage. But, that was good. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> Dance Now, it's CNC Music Factory. Are you crazy? It's a genius title. <laughs> and it worked so well. <laughs> do, 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 do. Get that but out I of heard that show was I heard that show was $25 million. That is not cheap. No. Like that's, that's a dollar for every like, viewer that didn't watch it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't quite know where I got that figure from, but I, I do remember somebody, somebody, a source that I should quote. Is, but, there, is there a danger but, yeah, if we stop was, having these, these sort of talent shows that there'll be no place for Irish boy band members to retire? <laughs> I would be worried. Where are they going to go? That is a frightening <laughs> vision of the future, Jess McGuire. <laughs> But that probably $25 million takes into account the phenomenal amount of advertising that they did to support the show. So, you know, that's a And big, buying format rights, maybe? Yeah, it's a big chunk of money. So. But the other thing I'd say about the market is that you would hope that Australian TV makers are taking their cues as much from American shows or British shows or, you know, that, that it is a global market now. And so it's not about... Uh, creating a little backwater where mm. you only belong to an Australian mm. tradition. You're, you're making a show that belongs to a tradition that's a much wider mm. one, and that exchange can be a really fruitful thing, I think. Can I ask Amanda a question? Amanda, no. with Secret Life of Us, did that get sold overseas? Did it find overseas yeah, markets? It did, it did, but it, it, had a lim- it had limited sales potential because what up often happens with Australian programming is it ends up in daytime, and because we swore, took drugs... Surprised that we that all the characters weren't alcoholic. The amount of drinking that was going on in the show, though, had sex. All those themes um, mean that you cannot play into daytime television in many territories. So, and also every territory is creating their own kind of show, prime time show. So it's very hard. It, it is why. Um, a lot of American shows don't always sit into our prime time here because we do have local content and people do want to watch our... You know, they do want to watch Pack to the Rafters in the same way that perhaps if The Sopranos had been well supported, you know, when it was on, it was on at 10.30 and not enough people watched it. So it's, you know, it's driven by... um, uh, their own territory's demands for their own local programming. So... (laughs) Um, with all these great uh, live-action dramas and comedies coming out, uh, what do you think the future holds for animated television? <laughs> well, I love right. Archer. Yeah. There are a whole lot of new animated TV shows that I'm adoring yeah. at the moment. And look, I think when we were doing that top 25 list, it's so easy because it's been there, it seems like, forever to overlook how brilliant The Simpsons is. It's Do you like, think it still is? Has uh, it outstayed its welcome? I th- well, God, 20-something 20 20 years. years. Yeah. I d- I, it's a good innings. I don't it? know. Every now and then you see a great episode mm. and you think, wow, thank goodness it's still there. And Family Guy is amazing. Mm. And I guess the thing about animation is it almost doesn't look like it dates that much. Like, it, it looks very current for a long time, so it's a good proposition for a TV network. Except I'd say Family Guy and The Simpsons are so loaded with pop cultural references. Yeah, that well, they, they, they are. It's only when like, there's a mention of something that you go, oh, yeah, this would be from the early 90s. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I think there's a whole generation of people who have got their references to music and movies through The Simpsons rather than the original music and yeah. movies. <laughs> but That's right. It, it's, it's a pretty iconic mm. TV show, but yeah. I don't know what the future is for animation because I gather it's, it's probably expensive to produce. You don't have star power except in the voices in, as a way of selling it, so I'm not sure. Mm. I do think that it does seem to be benefiting from uh, that cable uh, culture in the states as well that mm. smaller networks are able to kind of do very niche, very kind of be very good at what they're doing by not trying to pander to a wider audience. I guess South Park's another example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hate reality TV as much as the next person, um, and you might be stunned by this question as well. But do you think that there has been any uh, good reality TV shows either here in Australia or in the US? Jersey Shore. <laughs> is, it, is, that, is that good, really? I was going to ask a guilty pleasures question, but I don't need to now. You're a big fan of the situation? <laughs> I just found it. I couldn't turn it off. I just thought, this is the 
the best thing I've seen in ages. And there was a great moment where Matthew Weiner, I think, won his third. He's not responsible no, for No, no, he won, he won his third. Not in the same sentence. No, no, sure. but he won his third Emmy. And there was some comment about, you know, about all the great shows that are on that might have been overlooked. And January Jones just leant over and went, Jersey Shore? Like this. Matthew Weiner turned around and looked at her like... No, she just Imagine that's not the first time he's looked at January Jones like that. I, I think, and that, and that was the but moment that the Drapers got a divorce. It was just. And I sort of thought, good and on you, and Betty put pies. on weight, yeah. lots good of weight. Good on you. You know, you know, I know, I love Mad Men, but there's so much seriousness around it that I think he was someone who's in the world's mo- the, like most revered show at the moment, making a crack about how much she loves Jersey Shore, and you think, yeah, it's. There's every there's something for everyone, I guess. But so uh, when you evaluate television, you look at it, you look at what they're trying to do and how well they're doing mm. it. Because like Neighbours is never going to be Mad Men, mm. but in terms of I couldn't disagree. <laughs> oh, doing what claim. they're <laughs> Sorry. everyone just, update Twitter now. <laughs> but in terms of shows doing what they're trying to do well, reality TV shows, I think Amazing Race is pretty terrific at doing mm. what it's trying to do. I think Survivor, though it may have outstayed its well, welcome, yeah. it was pretty extraordinary in the early days. I, I found it compelling. I think back in its day, Race Around the World, uh, yeah, as an Australian yeah, was show, was incredibly ahead of its time. Mm. And it, it actually had real integrity to what it was doing in a kind of early reality yeah. TV mode. We were talking backstage about Queer Eye for the Straight Guy because it was such a phenomenon and then it kind of disappeared. It just burned itself out. But I, I wrote something recently about um, reality television because I felt like when it kind of started, it provided more of an interesting insight into people that were already kind of worthy of getting that behind-the-scenes insight. So for me, I found the Osbournes, when it, when it was on, at when the first series, really kind of revolutionary because... The idea of seeing Ozzy Osbourne, who was this guy that was so notorious for biting the heads off bats and all those stories, and there he is doddering around the house in his tracksuit pants picking up dog shit off the kitchen floor, and he was just like, he's got annoying teenage children, and their names were Jack and Amy and Kelly. I remember finding that really funny, that that Ozzy Osbourne's kids just had the most normal names possible. I mean, that for me, that show had its merit because I could understand why people would want to go, he's just, look at this fascinating, this is a couple of, this is Ozzy Osbourne. I feel like now it's sort of done this subtle shift in a lot of the shows. Shows that used to be about bettering people, not that they needed it, but, you know, like stuff like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, I used to cry at because I loved, I love any show, and actually this goes with The Biggest Loser as well, any show where someone sees that they're a hottie all along, and even though we all know that you're a hottie in your hearts and that's important, when someone becomes hot and they see themselves hot for the first time, I go, I will weep like a baby. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful moment. But for the other reality TV shows, there seems to be a tendency like, well, it used to be that you're interesting and worthy, so we will put you on television. Now it seems to be we've put you on television, so now you're interesting and worthy, and I don't think it works like that. I don't. I, I, I haven't watched much Jersey Shore, and, and I wouldn't claim to be an expert. I did watch one episode with her in Italy, and I couldn't understand why the little midgety one was... Why I was watching her have sex? I was like, can they do this on television? Why is she having sex with her boyfriend? But I think it's about anything. Reality TV is about how it's cast, I think, a lot of the time. And I think Amazing Race, the American Amazing Race and Survivor, they were beautifully cast, those shows. Mm. And I think even like after I thought I will never watch another um, uh, reality show, Second Night of the Boy, The Voice, bang, I'm there, I'm addicted, there's meetings in the office, like the whole, you know, they... they spun it on its head and spun it on its chairs and created something new and I could really understand why it worked. And then it sort of dropped off because it just became singers competing against each other and we'd been through all of that before. But I think in its initial stages, they found something new and they cast it brilliantly in Australia. The, like They really cast it very well, I thought. British writer John Ronson in his most recent book, The Psychopath Test, Uh, talks to a producer of reality TV and the very criteria they look for from their contestants are exactly the ones that are used to measure someone's level of psychopathy, which (laughs) explains quite a bit. We've probably got time for one last question, if there is one, and there it is, as far away from the microphone as is humanly possible. (laughs) Hi, thank you very much. I just wanted to give a few show shout-outs to Justified, The Walking Dead. Oh, yay, and 
and also Justified. Dance Academy on ABC3. It's a kid's show, but it's such a fun show. Smattering um, of applause for Dance Academy. So you're, you're in the right room. Nice. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think there's a broader trend going on in American TV, which is related to Empire. I think you've got The Sopranos, all of the crime shows, The Wire, Season 2 of Justified, Breaking Bad, and then Game of Thrones. There's a lot of Empire focus. Do you think America is saying goodbye to being the world's number one country? <laughs> Can that be a yes or no answer? <laughs> it can only be a yes or no answer. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I, th I think they're great in their television shows and in a lot of their independent films, and The Wire would be a great example at looking at what's wrong with their social structure and their politics. I think a lot of their TV shows do that really well. Um, and if you watch all the Baltimore, the David Simon Baltimore shows, you see that really strongly. And in, say, West Wing, you see a real altruism about politics and how it could be and what sort of smart you know, idealistic people can work there. So I think you get both, but there's also a lot of a sense of decay and things falling apart and structures not working properly. One of the things I was going to say was when Breaking Bad had its mid-season finale last week or whenever it was, I fell into a spiral of just reading things about it on the internet for about two days. Mm. And what amazed me was how much high quality criticism is out there how much you can just whether it's Grandland or the AV Club or a guy called Alan Seppenwall who I think is an amazing TV critic or there are these critics who spend all their time asking questions like that is this about community is this about empire is this about and it it's better than any literature studies I ever did at an Australian university in terms of density and and attention to detail sorry that was a bit of a rant I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's true. I, I, was, I agreed with what Debbie said, but I was just going to add that, um, that the one thing that I always think about when I think of The West Wing, which I also really loved when I watched it, was that obviously it was on during the Bush years, and the, the best description of it is lefty porn. It just, for everyone that was having to live in, in, a, in a Bush America and probably in a Howard Australia, just to, just this is how government could be in a dream. You know, we still, we still probably have to dream that way, even with the Labor government here, but... On that note, I think I just <laughs> we, we could keep way. talking. I am going to implore you. We do like these events to be the start of a conversation. Turn to a stranger who you haven't come here with on your way out and ask them for advice on a piece of American television they think you should watch. And give one of your own. I would like people to, those who haven't seen Margot Martindale in series two of Justified, go out and get it yes, right now at JB it's or amazing. download it illegally, except I didn't say that. <laughs> um, no, 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 you can get it on iTunes. I watch it on iTunes. As do I. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panel, Debbie Anker, Jasper Dwyer and Amanda Hicks. <laughs>